at the University of Georgia. And he was also my herpetology professor when I was in grad st- school. So I'm really excited for Dr. Mayers to join us. And we're going to learn all about why salamanders matter. Take it away, Dr. Mayers. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you, thank you uh, to the museum for having me tonight. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, make some acknowledgments. So Georgia. I'm going to be using a lot of and photographs was also in our my uh, herpeto- kind of presentation this evening. And a lot of those photographs come from a number of other people um, and so I want to acknowledge and thank them for, for making their photographs available. In particular, uh, in particular I want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Todd Pearson, who he probably is going to be the individual who provided most of the photographs you're going to see tonight. He's a very talented biologist and, and photographer as well. And I'm sure there are some photos in here where if I forget the acknowledgement, uh, I apologize to those individuals, but I um, uh, do hope you enjoy them uh, this evening. The other thing I want to do is, is to acknowledge that, you know, my own knowledge of salamanders has been shared with a number of people, but informed by a number of people, including a lot of talented people I've worked with over the years. Um, and so some of the work that or ideas that I'll be uh, sharing with you this evening uh, come from my collaborations with those individuals. And I wanted to acknowledge them and some of the organizations that make the work that we do possible. So um, I'm going to start with this amazing photograph uh, here by Anton, uh, Anton Sorokin. Um, this is of an Encetina salamander from the Western U.S. And this one of my favorite quotes uh, from uh, Bill Bryson, which is that salamanders are interesting and don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. And so one of my goals with uh, the, the presentation this evening is if you're here in North America, particularly in the Eastern U.S., if you're in North Carolina, um, I want you to recognize how special these animals are to you, what are some of the important and interesting things they teach us, and then what are some of the threats that uh, they face and what you might uh, be able to do about it. So if you are uh, thinking about amphibians, some of you may, may or may not know that, that salamanders are a group of amphibians. Uh, when you think about amphibians, salamanders represent only about 10% of all the amphibians in the world, uh, maybe just a little less than 10%. Um, so in, when we think about amphibians, most people think about frogs, and so more than 80% of all of the amphibians in the world uh, that we know of are frogs. But if you come to North America, about half of all our amphibians are salamanders. And if you're in the eastern U.S., particularly if you're in the Appalachian Mountain region up and down the eastern U.S., then about 60 to 70% of all the amphibians that we have are actually salamanders. So salamanders make our amphibian fauna really unique. We're different than any other place in the world in that most of our amphibians are a group of animals that most of the world seldom ever gets to see. Now, the other thing that's really important uh, from a conservation perspective, but also interesting, is that there are 10 lineages of salamanders in the world. So this graphic I show you on the right here is kind of a family tree of all the salamander families we have in the world. And in North America, you can find nine of the 10 major families of salamanders here in North America. And if you're in the southeastern U.S., including in like North Carolina and Georgia and South Carolina and Florida, you can find seven of those major lineages. So for us here, not only are salamanders an important and special part of our fauna, but the other thing is that you can find most of the amazing diversity of this group in our own backyards. And so that's something I think is really special about them. So this is a heat map of where salamander diversity is found around the world. And what the, the, as it gets uh, redder and redder, you know, gets warmer in color, what it's telling you is how many species you could find in that particular location. And so you can see there's large swaths of the world, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, that don't have any salamanders. And then there's good chunks of the world where they might have one species at a particular location. But you'll notice that kind of glowing area there in the Southeastern United States. And that represents a very high area of richness where you could find over a dozen species of salamander at a particular location. And you can notice that really, really hot red area that is centered on our Appalachian Mountains. And so we are kind of a global hotspot for uh, kind of a high density of salamander species right in that particular part of the world. And so it's a really important part of our natural heritage, but also one that we are responsible for managing and conserving. 
So we're fortunate because in that hotspot, we have this remarkable diversity of, as I said, all of these families and then all of these species within those families. And one of the things about salamanders is they're just incredible uh, in, in their patterns and variation in color and size and shape and ecology. So for example, we have things like the ambistomatid salamanders, which includes this yellow spotted salamander here. Uh, one of my favorite salamanders in the whole world, this is the marbled salamander, which you can find, uh, they breed in our winters down here uh, in the southeastern US. Um, we have really amazing uh, things like uh, the juvenile stage of our newt. So this is an eft of an eastern red spotted newt, and they get this spectacular bright orange coloration indicating that they are poisonous, and so it's a warning coloration. Uh, we have some really amazing salamanders that you would probably not recognize right away as being a salamander. So if I were to show you an animal like this that might be anywhere from two to three feet long, potentially, you might say it's an eel or think it's some kind of bizarre uh, snake or something like that. But this is actually an amphiuma, which is one of our largest salamander, our longest salamander species in North America. And you can actually see it has these tiny little limbs. Uh, that are kind of vestiges of went from an ancestor that would have had uh, longer appendages. And then our major salamander, so about 60% of all of the salamanders in the world belong to one family, and this is the Plethodontidae. And most of our diversity in the Eastern US is also within this group. And these are an incredible group of animals. They have a whole wide variety of, of uh, adaptations and, and natural histories but they all share one really amazing defining characteristic, which is they have no lungs. So if you think about this, more than, you know, more than 60% of all the salamanders on the planet have no lungs. They, they rely completely on their skin to take up oxygen and get rid of CO2. So a, a remarkable adaptation. This is our green salamander, uh, Anides aeneas, and it's a, um, a really, uh, amazing animal to see. They look like uh, kind of moss covered lichen and lichen covered rocks. We have things like uh, red-legged salamanders, like uh, this one, uh, one of the species that I study, Plethodon shermani, which you can find at high elevations in Western North Carolina. Um, Plethodon yanolasi, one of our largest uh, members of this uh, genus. Uh, really incredible animals uh, get really, really big. Um, in our streams, we have things like uh, this two-line salamander here. So this is a Blue Ridge two-line salamander. Um, in some of our cave systems, we have some species that are associated with the twilight zones of caves. So this is the cave salamander, uh, Uricea lucifuga. Uh, really incredible animal. They have these very long limbs and long toes, extremely long tails. So uh, really neat animals to see in the wild. We have some really... Uh, heavily aquatic species. So this, for example, is a spring salamander. Uh, one of the things that spring salamanders are famous for is they're kind of hunters of other salamanders. So they like to get out and try and find other smaller salamander species to, to forage on. This is arguably one of the most famous salamanders we have, certainly one of the most photographed. This is the northern red salamander. Uh, and they get, while they're in this kind of young adult to late juvenile stage, they are this spectacularly bright uh, orange-red color. And a lot of our uh, individuals, particularly in certain populations, get these dark black uh, uh, patterns under their chin and on their lip that people think kind of resembles a goatee. And then we have uh, uh, some species such as this uh, pygmy salamander, which is a very small salamander. So it would be maybe half the size of your small uh, finger if you're an adult. So very, very tiny, um, uh, really neat species you can find up in the mountains. Um, we have some highly variable species such as this uh, Ocoee salamander. And Ocoee salamanders are really neat because they come in such a wide variety of patterns and colors. Sometimes they have bright colors on their cheeks and, and sometimes on their legs. Um, and then I'll talk more. We have some species like this black belly salamander here, which are super abundant and really important in some of our stream ecosystems. So, one of the reasons that I love salamanders as a biologist and as a teacher at a university is that salamanders matter in part because salamanders seem to break all the rules that you learn as a biologist. So anything you seem to get taught in school or that you read or you learn about in college about biology, it seems like salamanders didn't read the book. And so they tend to be these animals that do things that we don't really think of as normally possible 
but make them really amazing uh, animals to study as a biologist. And so I thought I'd share a few examples of those, but I also give Greg a chance if he wants to interrupt me, since he asked you all why salamanders matter, maybe you also have some ideas about why they're cool. So Greg, at any point you can interrupt me and, and we'll, we'll see what some folks thought. So one of the reasons that salamanders are particularly cool is if anyone watching is familiar with amphibians, there's this kind of idea in everybody's head of a standard amphibian life cycle. So there's a, a, an amphibian, it lays an egg, that egg then hatches and there's this little larvae that can be a tadpole or a larval salamander, and then it will transform into some terrestrial stage and then grow up, become an adult, and you get this nice little circle. So you can find this diagram in just about any biology textbook. But a lot of salamanders, again, don't just do this. They do things much more complicated. So for example, in this mole salamander, for example, they actually have the ability to bypass metamorphosis for a while. And so they can stay in a juvenile body form, but they can grow large and become a mature adult. And they can actually breed in that larval form and they can even interbreed with individuals that have that terrestrial form. So those two animals at the bottom of this picture are both adults of the same species. And that one on the right can even turn into the one on the left at some point in its life cycle. So we have salamanders that can be essentially giant juvenile body forms that are mature animals capable of breeding. And so this creates this incredible plasticity and flexibility in their natural history. Our newts make it even more complicated. So our newts can do that normal life cycle of egg to larvae to juve. They metamorphose into that pretty orange juvenile and then eventually show back up to breed as an adult. But they can also stay in the water for a long time as a larvae and then mature and metamorphose into a terrestrial adult or they can go through partial metamorphosis. So they start the process of becoming a terrestrial adult, but they stop and they retain their gills and all of these other features that are associated with their larval form and they can breed in that form. And so you can see that this idea of this simple amphibian life cycle, there's a lot of salamanders that don't conform to that life cycle. They have this much more complex life cycle and they are very flexible in how they can move among these different life stages. Now, one of the other things that when I talk about salamanders kind of breaking the rules is that most people, when they think about amphibians, think about an animal that lives on land and it goes to water and it lays its eggs in water and then it has this larvae that grows up in water and it comes back out on land. But most of the salamanders that are in the family Plethodon today don't go to water to breed. In fact, a lot of salamanders, more like nearly half the salamanders on the planet, never go to water to breed. They breed on land and they lay their eggs on land. And then they grow up, they essentially do their entire larval phase inside an egg and then hatch out of the egg as a little miniature version of their adult form. And so this process of direct development is pretty amazing because lots of salamanders have liberated themselves from needing to go to water to breed. Uh, if you're down in the New World tropics, like in Central America, a lot of them are up in the canopies of trees and they lay their eggs in plants and stuff like that. And then they complete their development and hatch out as li you know, little miniature salamanders. And so this process of direct development is something that salamanders have been very successful at um, kind of evolving. And then it's led within this one group to a very successful life history strategy. So when you think about salamanders, you can't always think about that very typical life cycle that we think of with regards to amphibians. So I'll pause for a minute and see if Greg's got any uh, things that came in from the audience. If not, I'll keep going, Greg. Yeah, we have a, a couple questions. Um, Robin asks if you can explain how they breathe through their skin. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, the way they breathe through their skin is amphibian skin is very thin. So it has this upper layer that's only like, as an adult, maybe five to seven th cells thick. And then underneath that, they have that connective tissue, just like you have in your skin. And inside that connective tissue are blood vessels. So veins and arteries, just like in your skin. But unlike you and I, 
amphibians don't have a fat layer in their skin. And so things, it's so thin and it's so permeable that gases can go straight through readily so that CO2 can go out of the, the veins and right out into the atmosphere and oxygen can diffuse right into the arteries and oxygenate that blood. And so it's kind of like their skin acts like the in, like your lungs do. Their skin is essentially functioning as this very thin uh, uh, tissue that has blood vessels very close to the surface. Great, thanks. And then Robin also asked why certain species would skip metamorphosis. Awesome question. So there's a couple, it's a really interesting thing and we don't know all the answers to that question, but some of the things we do understand are this. So if you stay in the water, and, and there's enough food to, in the water, then you don't have to go through this process of going through metamorphosis and living on land and coming back to the water to breed and all of the delays and weather associated with that and some of the energetic costs associated with that. So you can kind of just stay at the pond, but sometimes ponds dry up. So you wanna get out of the pond. And also sometimes there may be parasites or predators or diseases in the pond and you wanna leave. So it creates this kind of trade-off. Should you stay at the pond and uh, take advantages of some of the things there, but then you pay the potential risks of a disease outbreak or um, some, you know, a a, uh, parasites being in the water, or you can leave and go out on land and avoid some of those risks, but you incur some other evolutionary costs. So it creates this trade-off and essentially the animals can respond to their environments and stay in whichever form is more adaptive for that current moment. But if they stay in that larval form as an adult, they can still eventually go through metamorphosis and go out on land. Once they go out on land as a, a land form, they're stuck in that form for the rest of their life. All right. So, uh, Greg, you can keep interrupting me as you need to, but I thought um, we, this related to the, that one question, right? So most salamanders in the world don't have lungs. That's a pretty amazing thing. The other thing that this picture is intended to illustrate is that a lot of salamanders we know can regrow limbs and their tails, right? So if some of you have ever handled a salamander in the wild, you probably have had the experience of maybe a portion of their tail breaking off. And you can see in this photograph of this dusky salamander that the tail is starting to regrow. So one of the amazing things about amphibians, in particular salamanders, is they have incredible regenerative abilities. So their skin can be regenerated at a very high rate, but they can also regrow limbs. And so I have seen animals and tracked animals in the wild where over years I find an animal and it's missing its left arm. And then I catch it, you know, a couple months later and it's got like a little bit of its upper arm. And then maybe I catch it a year later and it's got its whole arm, but it's missing a foot. And then over, you know, another couple of months I catch it and all of a sudden it has a foot and then the toes. And then eventually you look and it looks like a totally normal regrown limb. So this incredible regenerative ability of salamanders is one of the reasons that they are model systems for biological research is because we're very interested in how cells can regenerate and recreate things like a limb or other kind of appendages. And so we're very interested in it for our own potential benefit in understanding how organisms develop and how limbs regenerate. But it's a really spectacular feature of these. And in salamanders, what they can do is they can use that as a defense mechanism. So if a predator were to grab them by the tail and the tail comes off, the predator, the tail will actually continue to wiggle and the predator will go and eat the tail and the salamander can get away and then it can regrow that tail over time. So it's a really uh, cool adaptation that they have. Some of these salamanders also have evolved some pretty amazing things. So lots of salamanders, particularly within that group, that family where they're lungless, have evolved the ability to project their tongue. Now, some of them can project it like a centimeter, maybe a half a centimeter, which may not sound like a lot to you, but when you're a little animal the size of your finger, being able to stick your tongue out, you know, a, a, half, a half a centimeter, that's a lot. But a few species have evolved this spectacular ability. They've essentially evolved a slingshot and out on the end of that slingshot is the tongue. And so for example, in this hydromantes, the tongue is just this very little bit out on the end. And then there's this long cartilaginous rod. And so essentially this animal has evolved a body that allows it to launch its tongue all the way out on this rod and catch prey way away from the body. 
And this is an adaptation for some species that might be climbing species. So they live on cave walls or they live on, the, on trees and those kind of things. And they need to be able to ambush their, and, and catch their prey, but the substrate doesn't allow them to chase them down. And so they've evolved these really spectacular tongues for being able to catch their, catch their prey. Now, the next one I'm going to talk about is weird, like really weird, all right? So this is not supposed to happen in biology, but salamanders, again, they didn't read the biology textbook, so they, don't, they didn't know that this wasn't supposed to happen. So when you're around the Great Lakes region and in parts of the, the Western, you know, kind of like Western New York and stuff like that, we have a, a group of ambistomatid salamanders where there are these species that are all female. There are no boys. And in these salamanders, what they are is they are the offspring of two species that hybridized. So we have species A, for example, and species B. They hybridize and they produce species C, which is this female. And every one of these salamanders is a female. And so if we look in the, at this female and we look at her chromosomes, she will have one set of chromosomes from one parent species and one from the other. But she produces, when she produces eggs, so a normal animal like us or a mouse or a squirrel or a frog or something, normally when they produce an egg, it's only got half the chromosomes in it. But these female salamanders, when they produce an egg, will have two chromosomes in it and are capable of producing a viable offspring that is a clone of the mother. Now, where does this get really weird is that these females can mate with males of other species. So even though they now this this all female species of salamanders, they will mate and they don't have to mate with male, they can mate with males of two, three, four different kinds of species, potentially. And when they do that, sometimes they produce offspring where the male's genes just stay out. So even though they mate it, there's no dad. It's just another version of mom. And all of them are still female. And sometimes I can see Greg's looking very disturbed. Right this is not what he is supposed to be in his biology, biology textbook. But sometimes what happens is they'll produce an offspring, which it'll have both of mom's chromosomes and it'll have one of dad's chromosome sets. And so technically this salamander over here in the bottom left is a female. Is, they're all female, but they have the genes of three species in them. Yeah, Greg is like, no, that's not, you're, every animal is supposed to be a species, but that salamander could be three species in one animal, right? There are records of four species genes being in one animal. And just to show you what this can look like, this picture here from a paper, um, these authors are showing you here. So what you're seeing is you see the chromosomes in this animal and you know they're three different colors. So each of those colors corresponds to the genes of a, the chromosomes of a different species. So this chromosome in this, this animal in its cell is three different species at once. Amazing. So you have these all female unisexual salamanders that can breed with males of several different species and they can produce offspring and so this animal that has got three chromosomes could breed with another male and pick up another set and pick up a fourth species. And so we have, these things exist in reality. And yet what we know about things like being polyploidy in an animal is supposed to be a no-go. Like plants do this all the time, but this is not supposed to be what animals do. And yet salamanders, again, they didn't read the book. And so salamanders were like, oh, it works for us. And so we have these incredible groups of salamanders in North America that have a reproductive system that is not like anything we've seen in any other group of animals. So amazing uh, kind of ability to kind of bend the rules of biology. So Greg, I can pause for a minute if you wanna share anything that's come in on the chat. Yeah, I just wanna say, I think you blew a lot of people's minds with that <laughs> one. Uh, a lot of people are super surprised to hear that, including myself. That's yeah. incredible stuff. So when, I, when you finish watching our programs, uh, I encourage you to go over and uh, Google uh, something about unisexual salamanders on, on YouTube, and you'll see the work by uh, Rob Denton and Katie Greenwald. And Katie does this wonderful job of explaining and showing you these animals in the field. 
but these are real living, breathing animals that do things that we're just not taught, you know, in a biology class are supposed to be possible. And these animals are fine. They're perfectly viable, healthy animals. So amazing. Incredible. I, I did have a, a couple of questions I wanted to ask you before we go any further. Um, Coco wants to know, where does all that tongue go with the species that can kind of slingshot its tongue? Is there like a special- a Great store? question. So it kind of stores that rod in its body. And there's a, a, a structure called the hyobranchial apparatus up in the throat that um, I don't kind of have, it's hard to explain, so I won't kind of, you know, without a diagram. But anyway, you can kind of think of that. It has these muscles wrapped around it. And then believe it or not, it actually has um, muscular kind of uh, ligament or tendon attachments on the hips. So essentially this animal can use the, the muscular architecture of this structure in the throat to shoot the tongue out. And then it's basically using these attachments in the hips to pull that rod all the way back into the center of its body. So the tongue will rest in the mouth, but this rod is actually sitting down centrally in the body. Truly fascinating. Yeah. Um, and then Carrie wanted to know, um, with the limb regeneration, do we, um, do we see like tangible applications to human medicine yet? Or is that still in the development and research phase? Um, I don't know the full answer to that, so I'll just say I know that people have been working on it for a long time. There are limits to what human, like we can't necessarily, at least to my knowledge, give humans the ability to regenerate a limb the way that salamanders can. But, you know, they are vertebrates just like we are. They are tetrapods like we are. And so we can understand how um, limbs regenerate, how things like stem cells work, um, how cells organize themselves and then differentiate themselves. So this has potential applications to being able to engineer tissues. Like uh, it also has applications for how we may think about the ability to grow tissues, uh, you know, in, a, in an artificial setting. So whether someday we'll be able to modify human, you know, things to regenerate tissues, I don't know. I'm sure somebody's asking or thinking about that question, but, but how far the, the ideas of the extension of that application go, are, um, I'm not quite sure about. So what I'm going to talk about next in our why salamanders question is I want to talk about why salamanders matter. And my favorite slogan I tell people is because they kick biomass. All right. So what do I mean by that? Salamanders are, if you've ever been outside, you may have found one. Maybe you found one flipping a log or something like that. But it's really hard to appreciate how many of them are actually in an area because they're usually underground or they're hidden in burrows or down in crevices. And so even though you may find one or a bunch in an area, I don't think people can truly uh, understand how abundant they are. And my colleague Wick Gibbons you, you know, says this generally about amphibians and reptiles, that they're kind of hidden biodiversity, that they're sometimes hard to find or you have to go out under certain conditions to see them. And when you do that, you often don't get to see a lot of them. And so you can't appreciate how many of them there are. So in this table here, I don't want to, you don't have to bore into the numbers here, but I just wanted to make a point here. So these are some different estimates from different studies for how abundant one or sometimes two species of salamander can be in a forest in the eastern U.S. And you can see some numbers here, but a lot of them are somewhere between five and 50 or 70,000 individuals per hectare of forest. It's about five individuals per square meter. So imagine, to put that in context, imagine that you are sitting in a chair and you have four people sitting in your lap. That's, the, that's five individuals per square meter. That's how many salamanders are often in a forest patch. Now imagine if you had four people sitting in your lap and the person next to you had four people sitting in their lap and then the person next to them had four people sitting in their lap and you filled a room that way. That's the way salamanders are in their abundance. It's just that at any moment, most of them are underground. When we think about the species that have larvae, for example, in streams, we have found people can find somewhere anywhere between, say, 12 and 70 individuals per every meter of stream. And so sometimes these streams are only, you know, as wide as your foot, or they might be, you know, uh, a foot and a half across. And every three to four feet, you can find 50 individual larvae of one species. 
So those are kind of epic numbers. Like they are abundances that nothing comes close to. Birds don't come close to that. Mammals don't come close to that. So salamanders exist in these densities that are incredible. And they can do that because they're really energetically efficient and they're also very small, usually. So again, I don't want you to, to, to bore yourself with the text, but I do want to make a case that this is important. This matters to us. So for example, some of the work that's been done has shown that um, if you just take the salamanders in a patch of forest and you measure how much calcium is sitting in their bones and in their skin, how much nitrogen or phosphorus, these animals represent a significant standing stock. There is a significant amount of nutrients sitting in them. And that's available as nutrients for predators that might feed on them like turkeys and screech owls. But it's also just a great place to store those nutrients so that they don't leach out and move away from the forest. Um, some people have also found that uh, there's been a few studies, not all studies, but a few studies have demonstrated that when salamanders are present and abundant, they consume enough insects to slow down the rate at which leaf litter breaks down and is decomposed. And when we think about the potential importance of that, we store a lot of carbon in leaf litter. And when, and when leaf litter breaks down faster, what ends up happening is we lose more carbon as CO2 to the atmosphere. And of course, this is something that we, we expect as a, a valuable function of forests is that they hold on to carbon. And so there's some evidence that in some situations, salamanders may contribute to that process. Uh, when we think about aquatic systems, uh, one I don't have on here, but I can tell you that in two different studies, when people have looked in like ponds and wetlands, when you have salamander larvae in ponds and wetlands, you have substantial reductions in things like mosquito larvae. And so they are, because they are predators on mosquito larvae and they love to eat them, they will uh, reduce the populations of those things. And of course, mosquitoes are not just an irritating pest, but they're an important disease vector. Um, in, and so that, they contribute to our well being in that way. Um, the other thing that we have found is that salamanders in streams can, can reduce the number of insects, invertebrates in those streams, which can reduce decomposition rates in those systems. Um, and they're really good standing stocks, again, of nutrients. So things like phosphorus and nitrogen and stuff are kind of packed into these salamanders in these systems. And because they don't go, these things, these nutrients don't get kind of washed down the stream. Instead, they get retained. And when these amphibians metamorphose and leave the stream, they take those nutrients back out into the forest. So they're really good at catching nutrients, turning it into little you know, tissues as animals, and then re-exporting those nutrients out into the forest. And so this has benefits um, to us. The last thing is that um, amphibians are different than bugs and fish in the way that they excrete waste. And the forms of waste that they excrete can really increase nutrient retention in aquatic systems. So, so by being so abundant and by eating lots of insects and having some special properties, amphibians are influential in the way that nutrients are stored and moved around in ecosystems. And this has implications for thinking about productivity of ecosystems, for thinking about energy flow and supporting uh, higher levels of a food web, like uh, like raccoons and turkeys and owls and all that kind of stuff. And it also has potential implications for thinking about things like water quality, because we do want to retain nutrients up in our forests and up in these watersheds, because when we don't, they end up making their way downstream and potentially accumulating lower down in watersheds where they may be a problem. So I'm going to end the talk by talking a little bit about the problems that salamanders are facing, because I hope that I've convinced you that one, they're, we're pretty lucky to have them. They are, they are an important and major part of our amphibians. And hopefully someday we'll get most people in the US when people say, tell me about an amphibian. They won't talk about a frog, they'll talk about a salamander. And that we, we, we value them and then we just think they're awesome. They, they just do amazing things, they look cool, they're incredible and they can do all of these really amazing things that we're learning about. And then they also having them in our ecosystems can be beneficial potentially to humans. So we have to think then about our responsibility to steward that diversity. So this photograph here is from Western North Carolina. And I love this photograph. Some of you may recognize this place, right? So, so this 
this photograph is kind of like makes you want to be in the mountains, right? This photograph comes from this website. And I have, I'm not panning the people at the website, but they, they're promoting mountains as old as time itself, right? One of the reasons the Appalachian Mountains has such great biodiversity is that it's an ancient mountain system that's got lots of forest, it's got lots of rainfall. It's a really great place to be salamanders. So we, we are drawn to these places and we want to be there. So one of the things that the folks that I work with, we've been focusing on for a long time is, as we have been punching into the mountains, we have been building up the slopes of the mountains. We're not just farming the valley bottoms anymore. We're building up onto the hillsides. And some of you may have taken a vacation. I've taken a vacation where you love to be in a cottage or something overlooking an incredible view. So this map here is gonna take me a second to orient you, but this is a watershed in Western North Carolina. And all the way over to the left is the bottom of the watershed. So you can imagine you're down near the river and you're driving up these, this road, which you can see in white. And as you go up the road and you branch out, you're going uphill in high elevation. And one of the things that you'll notice there is that if you look on the Southern side, I might see if I can pull up the pointer here, Greg, to make sure people can see it. So you can tell me, can people see that, Greg? Looks like it. All right, yes. so if you look in this part of this map up here, you'll notice all of this brown. It's mostly green, but there's these little bits of brown. And what you're looking at there is people building homes at high elevation up in our mountains. These are recreational vacation homes and, and residential homes up in our mountains. So the problem that we face is that those streams around there and those forests around there harbor most of our salamander diversity. We find most of our species at mid and upper elevations where it's cooler and wetter, slopes are steeper and all those kind of things. So one of the things that we started to ask and Kristen Sakala, my former PhD student, she was very involved in this is what impact is it potentially having when we go from a situation like you see in the upper photograph where you have a person working through a nice forested stream to where there's a stream below, which used to look like the one up above, but now it's going through a front yard. So what's the impact of having this development in Appalachia on salamander diversity and abundance? So I'm just gonna jump to the punchline here. And what you're looking at here is a graph and you can see that this graph, I wanna focus on the one over here on the left. So when you're over here on the right side, that's a fully forested area. That means that stream is surrounded 100% by forest. And when you go all the way down here, this is a stream, for example, over here where it's lost 60% of the forest around it and only about 40% remains. And this black line is the change essentially in what you can think of as the abundance of salamanders. In this case, it's the black belly salamander, which is one of those species that's really important in catching nutrients in a stream. And so to give you a sense of where things are in North Carolina, the average area in Western North Carolina in 1973 was about here. Oh, sorry. By 2012, we were here. This is what Western North Carolina, areas like Macon County, Western North Carolina, this is where they project their watersheds to be by 2030. Okay, and so you can see that we are going from a situation of a natural state like this to North Carolina kind of being like this on average to within the next 10 years, potentially having most of our streams on average, having only lost about 40% of the forest cover, but having lost about, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 75% of the salamander abundance in that system. So we want people to be aware that this doesn't mean we can't have homes in those areas. It doesn't mean that we can't use those areas, but the retention of forests and the protection of forested streams in Western North Carolina is really important to the conservation of salamanders in that part of the world. Now, one of the other things that we've been focusing on is trying to understand why is it that you can lose such small amounts of forest and yet the salamanders seem really sensitive to it. 
So I thought I would tell you about a really fun and cool study we did to try and figure that out. So what we did is we went into Western North Carolina and we found some areas of forest where people had cut holes in the forest. So for example, if you look in that bottom photograph, what you're looking there is a power line right away for being able to install electric power lines in the Nantahala Mountains. And we took advantage of a really cool behavior that salamanders have. So salamanders are kind of like teenagers. They don't like to go anywhere. And if you, let, if, you, if you take them and you move them away, they seem to manage to come home. So they have this behavior we call homing. They don't like to stay away. They want to come home. So what we did is we used this to our advantage, and we picked up salamanders, and we would move them to the other side, up or down the stream. And some of them end up on the other side of one of these gaps that we've created, like a power line right away or a road right away. And then we measured the rate at which they return. And one of our ideas was that maybe these small roads that were starting to build up in the mountains and these power line right of that were starting to cut up in the mountains, because they're not covered, even though they're small, maybe they're causing the salamanders not to move up and down the streams. And what happens is that, that kind of interrupts the way population uh, maintenance works. And that's exactly what we found. So we found, just to give you a sense, if you have a uh, forest gap that is one of those transmission power line right away for running electrical wires, it reduces the movement of salamanders in that stream by 92%. Salamanders do not like moving across these small gaps that we create in the forest. So even though we keep most of the forest around the area, these small reductions in forest cover interrupt their movement in the system. And that movement is really important for making sure that populations uh, have dispersal that goes on to sustain them. And if a population goes extinct or has some declines, there's somebody can get in there and recolonize it. And so we believe that these interruptions of the forest, even though they're small, are having an impact. So one of the things we hope is that people would consider maybe planting cover over these sections of stream so that we reduce the, the kind of negative impact of these uh, power line cuts and road corridors and things that we keep. So we're big proponents in Western North Carolina of the Shade Your Stream program. Shaded streams help salamanders. The other one that I want to mention that is relevant to a lot of people, depending on where you live, is the idea of invasive soil fauna. Now you may like, what are you talking about? So I'll tell you two things. So I would hazard, Greg, if, if we ask, you can let people drop in the chat, how many people have seen an earthworm in their lifetime? Probably everybody's going to say yes. But most people are not aware that nearly very few of us have ever seen a native earthworm. Most of the earthworms that we find in our natural environments are introduced. They were originally introduced from Europe. And over the last 30 years or so, we have a lot of species from Asia. And these species occur, at, they're much larger, they occur at much higher densities, and they have a really big impact on leaf litter. The other thing that humans have been really good at as, is introducing ants. And ants are an important diet for a lot of amphibians, including salamanders. So any of you who have had experience with fire ants know we're really good at introducing annoying ants, right? So we've done a lot of work on the issue of earthworm invasion. And I just want to point out, I'll just kind of give you the punchline of this. So it turns out that salamanders love to eat these earthworms that we brought in the system. And sometimes they'll gorge themselves on them. But where we have high earthworm populations, we tend to find fewer salamanders. Not always, but often we find fewer salamanders. And the reason is, is because those worms, when the salamanders aren't eating them, the salamanders can't seem to control the worm population. And those worms start eating all of the leaf litter that's on the forest floor that the salamanders depend on for cover. They also depend on that leaf litter to find lots of small prey like ants and mites and snails and all kinds of little insects in that leaf litter. So while they can eat the earthworms as adults, they struggle to find other kinds of prey when earthworms aren't available or if they're juveniles. They can't find enough food to eat. And so their populations decline. And so even though earthworms are a potential resource for salamanders, they seem to have a net negative effect on their abundance in these things. And so this has become a problem in the Northeast and some parts of the mountains where, where people have seen after earthworms really invade and take over the system, the salamander populations tend to decline dramatically in those forest areas. 
The other one then is, I want to point out, is just an example. We have a number of invasive ants, but this one uh, is, is particularly interesting to me. And I think it was first described or first discovered in the U.S. outside Charlotte, uh, I believe. I could be wrong there, in an, a suburban area. But this ant is very common. In fact, for most people watching, if you go out in your garden or a woodlot around your house and you flip over and you see some ants, there's a very good chance it's this species. And this is an Asian species of ant that has been introduced. Now, um, one of the things that they're famous for, they're known as the Asian needle ant. And they get that name because they're actually a very docile ant. But if you, like, if you get them trapped, like between the cuff of your sleeve or you, know, you pin them by accident, they have a really powerful sting. And so they, it can be quite a wallop. So you can think, well, okay, they're not aggressive, so they're not, not a lot of people get stung. You know, there are some people get stung each year, but it's not that big a deal to us. But salamanders, about 60% of the diet of most salamanders like we find in our forests are ants. And there's two potential challenges with these needle ants. So in the graph on the right, these are the abundances of, of our native ants as a function of how many Asian needle ants you find in a forest. And you can see as the Asian needle ants increase along the bottom here, essentially our native ants collapse, they disappear. And this top graph up here is the primary ant group, the ant genus that our salamanders eat. So when we have these Asian needle ants move into suburban or now they're even in national forests like the Nanahill and the Chattahoochee and stuff, when they move into those areas, they collapse the ant population that our salamanders depend on. The salamanders might be able to eat the needle ant, but those needle ants like to sting. So one of the things we don't know is whether or not salamanders might avoid eating them or whether or not salamanders might be impacted by the sting and therefore not able to use these invasive ants as a potential prey. The last two things I'll just mention briefly, I apologize if this is a little blurry for you, but um, a few years ago, so some of you may be aware that amphibian declines have been occurring kind of globally. And in large portions of the world, this is due to a fungus. And that fungus was introduced and it, imp uh, it impacts the way uh, amphibians regulate um, uh, electrolytes, essentially um, ions in their skin. So there is a relative of that fungus that has been detected in Europe. And in Europe, where it's gotten in contact with salamander populations, it's caused local extinctions of salamanders. So it kills them aggressively. So if, for example, this fire salamander from Europe that is in the picture here, they are getting decimated by this fungus. The fungus is introduced from salamanders in Europe, or in Asia, excuse me, and probably almost certainly were introduced to, to Europe through the pet trade. So people who are interested in salamanders and get them as pets, that pet trade imported this fungus to Europe and that fungus is decimating wild salamander populations. We are extremely worried about the potential for this fungus to get into North America. It has not been detected yet, but there's a very active surveillance program, but it's something that we're very concerned about because I said at the very beginning of the program, salamanders are our jam. Right? They're half of our amphibians. They're two thirds of our amphibians in the Eastern US or in Appalachia. So a salamander killing fungus is potentially devastating to us. Hopefully not all species are sensitive to it. So maybe some of our species are resilient and I hope that we don't get it into North America. But that is going to require people to be much more conscious about the idea of how and why you purchase things like salamanders through the pet trade. So that, that hopefully we are able to prevent what's happening in Europe uh, and not get this fungus here um, in North America. And the last thing then is kind of a, a, a real overarching challenge, which is climate change. So a lot of our diversity, as I mentioned, is in the Appalachian region and it's at high elevation. And the reason it's there is because it's cool and it's wet. And we have a lot of species that are what we call high elevation endemics. And what we're hoping is, or what we're worried about is if those areas start to experience more frequent droughts, a rising temperature, that some of these high elevation endemics may be lost due to climate change. So for example, Plethodon shermani here, this is an example of a high elevation endemic. We tend to find them in very wet forests up over 
you know, 3,000 feet. And below that, they either hybridize with other species or we get, they get replaced by other species. So one of the things that we are concerned about is trying to understand how some of these species will respond to things like climate change. And we don't know all the answers at this time. So I think I'm just going to leave it there, Greg, and then use the rest of the time for answering questions and, and seeing what kind of thoughts people have. Sure, we got about five minutes for questions. Um, let's see here. Somebody asked at the very beginning, when you're talking about regeneration, how many times can a salamander regrow their tail? They can regrow them, as long as it breaks naturally, they can regrow them over and over again. An interesting thing about the tail is when they first grow their tail, the, so one thing that, well, let me back up. So when you look at a salamander skeleton, they don't mineralize all their bones. So a lot of the bones stay cartilaginous, and then some of them mineralize like our bones. When they grow their tail the first time, it is all mineralized bone. So all the vertebrae are bone. When they regrow it, they'll regrow the vertebrae, but they'll stay as cartilage. And if the tail breaks again, they can regrow it again, but it will remain a cartilaginous tail. So they never go back through the process of mineralizing that tail. Wonderful. Um, and then when you're surveying for salamanders, how do you know that you're not recapturing the same individuals? Do you mark them somehow? We do. Um, so when we are marking them, what we do is we actually use a, 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 an approach that was developed for fish. Um, and what we're doing with that is it's, it's kind of like a, a it, it almost looks, feels like toothpaste in, in composition and it comes in different colors. And so we can inject it just under the skin different colors in different locations. And it kind of gives like a unique tattoo to the salamander. And then within about a few hours, if we've you know, mixed it properly, then that will um, set and it, it's spongy. So it flexes with the animal, but it binds to the, to the injection point. And so it's supposed to, in theory, become a permanent mark on the animal. And so we can mark these animals. And I can tell you that we have animals that we caught in 2010 when they were a brand new hatchling that was only, you know, a centimeter and a half long. And we have recaptured that animal 11 years later as a full grown adult. And the marks are all still there. And that's, that also highlights another thing. These things live a long time. So some of these salamanders that we have, they're the size of your finger. We're confident live, can live up to 20 years. Well, I had no idea they lived that long. Yeah, they well, live, a, they can live a long time. A let's, long time. Let's, ended on a call for action. What is the most important thing that we as citizens of North Carolina and beyond can do to protect and conserve salamanders? Great question. So the, if my advocacy is this, we need to protect two things. We need to protect cool, moist, high elevation habitats where we have a lot of this diversity. So being sensible about how you develop those landscapes and ensuring that when we have to cross streams or take out sections of forest, we think about keeping shade over certain features and those kind of things. That would be one of the greatest things we could do. Protect habitat. And then whenever you use it or you do impact habitat, try and uh, remediate some of the impact that you would see on salamanders, like disconnecting movement in forest streams and stuff like that. Um, the second thing is that we have to start thinking about change, right? So climate change is such a big backdrop and some you know, degree of climate change is already baked in. And we don't fully know what will change in Appalachia. It might get wetter, but it might get warmer, right? So we don't, we don't fully know what will happen in those areas. So what's really important is to have our landscapes be adaptable. So it needs then for animals to be able to migrate uphill or to move you know, as, as climates kind of shift. So we don't wanna think about creating habitat protection that's static. We wanna think about protecting you know, areas where, where populations can migrate or change or, you know, move up or down and, and shift and those kind of things. We've done some work to help um, that in North Carolina by, for example, trying to produce maps of models where we think there's really good salamander habitat. And then anyone in North Carolina can say like, okay, we have a good model of where salamanders would do really well. Are we developing that area? Or should we think about maybe setting some of that area in protection or something like that? And the hope is, is the communities will make those decisions themselves. 
those are all great things to hopefully preserve these animals. And um, I, Dr. Mayers, I just want to say thank you. I know folks who are watching and my colleagues have been amazed with all the wonderful information that you've provided here tonight. So uh, thank you, everybody. Go out. I encourage you to learn more about salamanders, and let's all do our part to protect these amazing species. Sure. Uh, if you want to learn more about salamanders and other reptiles and amphibians, we have two more days of talks for you. Our staff's going to drop that link in the YouTube so that you can uh, learn all about the amazing programs that we're going to offer over the next two days of reptile and amphibian days. And we just want to say thank you to all of our members who make events like reptile and amphibian days happen. Um, if you sign up or renew your membership today, you can get a free reptile and amphibian t-shirt with one of Dr. Mayer's favorite salamanders, the marbled salamander. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. There is another program immediately following this, Science Tonight, where you can learn all about tortoises. We hope to see you there. Good night.